So, we come to a fun topic, and I'm excited about it. Uh, how many of you used to love going to grandma and grandpa's house when you were a kid? Anyone? Why did you love going to grandma and grandpa's house? Spoiled rotten. I know for me, I loved going to grandpa's house. We used to go there and grandpa would just put on the works. There'd be ice cream as soon as we walked in the door. The Viennetta, you know, the ice cream cake with the chocolate. Oh my gosh. I still think about it and it's still good. So we used to, like, it was chocolate, ice cream, more chocolate, biscuits. The cricket would just be on all the time. I'd sit there with grandpa just lapping it up, loving every moment of it. And I could do whatever I wanted to do in grandpa's house because it was grandpa's house and it was grandpa's rules. And grandpa had this one little drawer at the sort of pretty close to the front door. And what he would do, he had that drawer. And in that drawer, it was full of little lollipops. And what would happen would be as you were leaving, because mum or dad had come to pick you up, his grandpa would very quietly open the little drawer and he'd grab a little lollipop and he'd try and slip it into your pocket. And he'd be like, there you go, mate, enjoy. (laughs) And if you're lucky, you got in the car without dad seeing, you pop that lollipop in the mouth and you're just sitting back there, just spinning that thing, you know, just be like, what are you going to do about it, dad? Grandpa's house, grandpa's rules. And I got the lollipop. But every now and then, dad especially, because it was his dad, would see grandpa putting the lollipop. Sometimes it was money. They were the best days when he just dropped money in your pocket. But often it was a lollipop. And he would see him doing that. And then all of a sudden, dad and grandpa would have a discussion. And I say discussion lightly because grandpa would be like, oh, Bill. Because my dad's name's Bill. What a great name for a dad. He'd go, Bill, he goes, just let them have it. Just let them do it. It's not going to harm them. It's my house, my rules. I can do what I want to do. Just let them have it. And dad would be like, excuse me, dad. They do not need it. You're not the one paying their dental bills. You don't have to put them to bed tonight. And he'd carry on and they'd have this debate back and forth. And I'd be standing there with my brother and my sisters looking at the lollipop with dad and grandpa and thinking, well, whose rules do I follow? Because technically, I'm under grandpa's house, therefore I'm under his rules, so I could take that lollipop, and dad can't do anything about it. But in 10 steps, I'm no longer under grandpa's house, and therefore I'm no longer under grandpa's rules, and I'm back under dad's rules. And if I choose to take the lollipop from grandpa, there may be consequences for the decision that I've just made when I get in the car with dad. Rules. We all grow up with different rules, don't we? Life's a little bit like this. You know, everyone's grown up in a different family, and each family has different rules and different ways of going about it. My house, my rules. Some of you grew up in the cool house where mum and dad let you do a whole heap of things, and the rest of you grew up in the not-so-cool house where mum and dad didn't let you do stuff. And I was like, well, if you want to be under my house, it's my house, my rules. My roof, my rules. And the really interesting thing about that is as you grow up and you start to become an adult, then you have a choice. Like, am I going to choose to stay in this house under this authority and therefore submit to these rules? Or am I going to leave this house, make my own rules, and bear the consequences of that? It's a part of being an adult. You scoop your own ice cream. Whose rules are you going to follow? What rules are you going to choose to walk under? And then we come to this super interesting topic today, because today we're talking about sex and marriage. And the interesting thing about sex and marriage is that we have a world, a society, who is very loud about the rules that they've made up about this topic. You see, our world has made up its own set of rules about sex and marriage and sexuality, and it's declaring them, it's declaring them ferociously, and they, it's loud, and they're yelling it. And because it's so loud, this topic has become so taboo in the church Because now what society will tell us is if we dare to speak a different rule to the rule that has already been spoken, well, that's hate speech. That's discrimination. That's bigotry. How dare you disagree with our rules? But here's what I want to say. Just because someone's yelling doesn't mean that the other voice shouldn't be heard. Just because there's one voice that's super loud doesn't mean that the other voice isn't valid. And we need to be very careful, we need to be very thoughtful about whose rules we're going to follow. And so today I want to preach into this, and I'm going to preach from the topic, the title of this message is Sex, Lies and Lollipops. 
sex, lies, and lollipops. And what I really want to do in this moment is I actually want us to contemplate what are dad's rules? We know what the world's rules are. We've heard the world's rules. They're loud, but what are dad's rules? What is God's rules when it comes to sex and marriage? And I had one of my buddies who may be listening, hello Nick, from Ballarat, texted me during the week and he saw my three key points from last week, the seed, the root and the fruit. And he goes, are you sure this isn't next week's sermon? (laughs) Let it sink in. I was like, no, mate, we got a different title for that one. Sex, lies, and lollipops. So here we go. Sex, lies, and lollipops. What are God's rules for sex and marriage? And here's the great thing about God that I also want you to grasp, right, is that you're an adult. And so you can hear dad's rules and you can hear what he has to say about it, but it's your choice. This is the great thing about our God. He doesn't force you to stay under his roof. He doesn't force you to live in his house. It's your choice. You can hear dad's rules and then make your own decision and that's on you. The consequences of that are on you, right? So you get to make a decision as what you do with dad's rules, but you better make sure you know what dad's rules are before you make your decision. And so today I just want to unpack what are dad's rules and we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. One simple verse, which says, marriage should be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. That's it. One simple verse, one simple proclamation. And in this verse is the chasm between Christianity and culture today. Right here, this verse, this is where that chasm between Christianity and the way we view the world and the way we view sex and marriage and this chasm is being dug more and more and more as it diversifies from the rules set forth in our society and our culture. Who gets to define marriage in this generation? Who gets to define what constitutes marriage? Good and bad. Who gets to define sexuality? Who gets to define what's moral and immoral? And whose rules should we listen to when it comes to sex and marriage? Now, these are the questions that are throwing around. And with a topic, you know, this taboo in the church, and we're going to talk about it. And some of you are sitting there, you've got your legs crossed, your arms crossed. It's because you're awkward and you're feeling a bit nervous and protective. You're like, we don't often talk about this in church. I'm not sure about this. Where do we begin? Where do we start with a topic like this? You know, how, with this passage and the way our culture views it, how should we begin? And I think it's a good idea to start with Julie Andrews' advice and start from the very beginning. Why? Because it's a very good place to start. We'll start from the very beginning because it is a very good place to start. So here's my question to you. What if we assume that page one is true. What if, what if for one moment we assume that page one in this book is true? What if we take the very legitimate, rational, scientifically reasonable position that everything that we see around us, that the person sitting next to you, maybe the person you love, maybe just a stranger who's sitting there and now it's awkward, What if we assume that everything didn't come from a random collision of nothingness in a complete vacuum of nothingness? What if we assume that this planet that we live on, that just happens to sit on the perfect axis, rotating at the perfect speed, in the perfect orbit around an uncontrollable ball of fire in infinite space in the perfect solar system where all the different gravitational pulls just happen to cause this planet as it orbits to not get too close to that ball of fire that we burnt up and not too far away from that ball of fire that we freeze. What if all of this in all its infinite glorious intricacy is not the result of nothing creating nothing. What if this is true? 
what if all of this didn't come out of an explosion of nothingness, but what if all of it came from the explosion of a creative God who said, let there be. And if we assume that that is true, which is a very reasonable, logical position to take, then would it not stand to reason that the God who created that would want to reveal himself to his creation? And would it not stand to reason that this creator, this designer, the intricacy, the work, just look into the person's eyes right next to you, just for one moment. Tell me that you don't see more than just an eyeball with a hole that light passes in that happens to land on some cells which happen to just evolve at the back of that eye to therefore create a picture on a brain that you have been trained to articulate as another person. Tell me you don't see more than that. Tell me there's not more. Like, you're not just skin and bone. You're not just flesh. You're not just nothingness made something. No, you are intricate, incredibly, valuably designed. And if the God who did all of that did it for a reason, would he not reveal that to his people? Would he not want to reveal the intention of his creation to his creations? And if sex and sexuality is as important to him as it is to us, don't you think that he'd find a way to let us know about that? And if he's a creator and he's a designer, how do you think he would go about doing that? Because to me it makes sense that if he's a designer that he would put it on paper as a blueprint. That he'd get someone to write it down. And don't you think it would also make sense knowing his creations and knowing the fact that we love to read maybe three pages and get bored and move on, that he would actually go, well, if this is so important, I'm going to put this right in the introduction so that they won't miss it. I'm going to show the design, the purpose of my design. I am going to reveal the why behind the what right here in the opening few pages. And if that's so, when we open chapter 1 and we read through chapters 1, 2, and 3, you would think that we would see something about the nature of sex, sexuality, and marriage, if it's important to God. So why don't we have a look and let's see what the designer sets forth. Because in chapter 1, we see something fascinating when it comes to sexuality and marriage in the design of creation. I'm talking God's rules here. I'm talking the designer's design. What do we see about the plans that he has set forth? We see opposites that go together. Heaven, earth, light, darkness, day, night, morning, evening, land, sea, sun, moon, plants, animals, opposites that go together, opposites that go together, opposites that go together, all through the creation story. He's saying something. He's saying that out of this, he then says, it is good, that God's goodness is revealed in opposites that go together. And then he arrives at this particular point, the pinnacle of his creation, and he says he creates male and female. Male and female, he created them. He repeats it, which means he's trying to say, this is important. I'm trying to get you to see something about the intention behind my design. Opposites that go together, male and female, these things go together. And then he says that these things are not just good, they are very good. Opposites that go together, opposites that go together. And you're like, fantastic, Dave. Opposites that go together, I have that desire. So the bloodhound gang must be right when they said, you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. Let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. (laughs) God created. Opposites that go together, we go together, baby. We need to keep reading because the next thing you're going to discover is you and me, baby, are so much more than mammals. Look at the designer's design. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says this, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Heaven, earth, light, darkness, day, night, sun, moon, land, sea, plants, animals, and then the pinnacle is different. Everything else came from nothing. Everything else is spoken and it was. Everything else is just, it wasn't and now it is not humanity. Humanity is handcrafted from the dust of the earth. 
and he creates man. And as he creates man, unlike everything else which had life in it, no, no, this we're laying formless and empty. There's no life in us. And so what does God do? He breathes his spirit into that formless mass and it says, and it became a living being. As God breathed, so the spirit of God encounters the flesh of man and what is birth there is this Hebrew word called nefesh. Everyone say nefesh. And what that word literally means is soul. The light behind the eyes, the consciousness, the thing that you know is true that there's more than just flesh and bone. He says, here's what I want you to see. When I created humanity, you're different. You're set apart from everything else. You're not like everything else. You're made in my image, it says. My image, you're like me. You're not me, but you're like me. There's something unique and special about you. Body, soul, spirit. You are not just physical and you can't separate those things. Without the soul, without the spirit, there is no physical life. We love to talk about, that was a spiritual experience or, you know, that hurt my soul. And we'd love to separate, oh, that's just a physical act. No, 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 you can't have a physical act without a soulful encounter. You can't do a spiritual thing without a, without a physical encounter. The, the, this is who we are. We're three in one. We're supposed to be in his image. We're supposed to point to who he is. Three in one. Those things are all interconnected. And here's what that means for you. It means that sex is not an animalistic encounter. Sex is not just a physical thing that you do and you move on. No, sex is a spiritual experience. Sex has deep, profound meaning. It is all of you encountering all of someone else. And when you come together, you form one life. You're so much more than a mammal. When was the last time you saw a monkey walking around with jocks on? When was the last time you saw a lioness just popping on some lingerie at the zoo? You don't, ever. Why? Because they don't need to cover up because they are not what we are. There's something different about us. There's something unique about us. And so what is God saying to us in this? Well, let's keep reading the blueprint because as we keep reading the blueprint, we discover something because in chapter two, verse 20, we see so Man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sea, and the wild animals, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and then he closed up the place with the flesh, and then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. Friends, Hebrew word here, catch this. The word for man is ish. Everyone say ish. The word for woman is ish ah. Everyone say ish ah. See something, same but different. Same but different, same but different. Opposites that go together. Ish and ish ah. This is how God made us. He says he takes woman out of our sight takes a woman from the rib of man. There's this, I don't know about you, there's this beautiful picture that I see in that is that a woman comes from my side. She's not from my foot. A woman is not to be trampled on. A woman is not to be abused. A woman is not to be stepped over. No, a woman is from my side. A woman is not from my head. She is not to be exalted above myself. She's not to be worshipped. No, no, she is, a, she is my partner. She is by my side. It's a symbiotic relationship. We're supposed to walk together. My arm goes around her. My job as a man is to protect her. And you say, Dave, that's incredibly sexist of you in this modern society. I'm a postmodern woman. I don't need anyone protecting me. I'll handle myself, thank you very much. I'm like, all power to you. I'm sure that you have got a great capacity in a street fight. But the point I'm making is that the female bench press record is about 150 kilos less than the male. What does that mean? It means we're same, but different. Same, but different. Same, but different. Opposites that go together. We're supposed to fit together. Like the rib, the rib protects the heart. 
So a woman has a role. Does it's not just the, not just a handbag? No, the woman protects the heart. There's, there's roles. Oh, it's a different message, but we're different. We're same but different. Same but different. Ish and ish are. Why am I harping on this point? Go to verse 24. Because when you see verse 24, it makes sense. It says, that is why, in another translation, for this reason, for this reason, that is why, therefore, because of this design, because of how I've made you, same but different, because of the fact that you're uniquely mine, because all creation is pointing to this glorious promise of what I have for sexuality and marriage and my design in creating humanity and the way you should interact together. Because of all of this, a father and mother, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his what? Wife. Not girlfriend, not random partner, not hot chick you met at the pub, wife. Don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger. He wrote it. I'm just telling you God's rules. I'm just telling you God's rules. I'm telling you what dad has to say about this. He leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife for this reason friends the creative intention is that sex was created for marriage that's why God this is the designer's design sex was made for marriage that's the designer's design why let's explore it you know in these two passages you can pick up a whole lot of good stuff that comes out of this here's the first thing why because sex is the bonding together of a one flesh relationship sex is the bonding together of a one flesh relationship what do I mean by that this is why a man leaves his father and mother is united to his wife and they become one flesh that word flesh in the Septuagint which is a Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament is the word bios bios is where we get our word biology it means life they become one life. You're not getting it. What did we just talk about? The nature of who we are. A life is not a physical thing. This is not just me and her physically coming together. No, this is my life becoming one with her life. It's about soul ties. It's about soul ties, about my soul and my spirit and my physicality combining with hers and being so connected that we are bound, bound together. It's like that old illustration. If I had more time, we'd take the pink paper and the blue paper and get the, the glue and we'd stick it together. And as you stick that together, it literally becomes one. You can't separate them anymore without one being taken to another. It causes a tearing. You can't divide it. You have become one life. Souls forever connected in that space. And this is what the act of sex is supposed to do. Sex is God's gift to marriage. It is a gift whereby when two people come together in a covenant relationship, they are bound and brought together. Lives connected powerfully, intimately. It's an amazing gift that God has given us. It's the super glue that binds us together it's not to be used for multiple people you don't super glue yourself to that person and that person and that person it's a one flesh union between a man and a woman in marriage and in that union he then gives another promise he gives another picture of his design because in that union then we have reproduction That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Over in chapter one, when it gives the summary, it talks about the fact that it says, go, be fruitful and multiply. There's no other people yet. Adam and Eve don't have a father and a mother. God is putting something in place here. He's establishing a family unit. He's talking about what he wants to be the Stable, strengthening pillar of civilizations. And it's not just about producing kids, it's about reproducing his intention in his design to the world. He's saying this, when your family units are strong, 
And when the gospel's being proclaimed and you're not chasing over everything, when there's strength there, then your cities will be strong, your communities will be strong, your nations will be strong. He's saying, this is the unit, this is the building block. And this is where reproduction should happen. And then it says, number three, marriage mirrors God's love for his church. You say, where's that, Dave? Well, go over to Ephesians chapter five. In Ephesians chapter five, do you know what Paul does? Quotes page two. Sits on page two. You know what Jesus does? I think it's in Mark 10 when they ask him about sex. He quotes page two. (laughs) These guys are like, hey, it's God's design, bro. Page two, man, go to page two. Page two is where I want you to go. And in this, Paul picks up this powerful thing as he's talking about marriage. And he's like, guys, see something. This is a picture of God's love for his church. This is a picture of God's purpose for his church. This is a piece. So it talks about how Christ is the husband, that Christ is the head of the church, the husband of the church, and the church is the bride of Christ. He's saying, this is picture of what I'm going to do. This picture of how I'm going to cause my people to move forward into my promises and purposes is that I am going to leave the throne of heaven and I'm going to take on flesh. I'll be same but different. Do you see it? Same but different, same but different. And you'll be united to me in my death and in my life, in my resurrected life. You will be brought from death to life. This is the picture. This is what I'm trying to show you in marriage. It's pointing to something so much greater. And so therefore, every marriage is supposed to point that to our world. This picture of fidelity, faithfulness, because our God is faithful. Intimacy, because our God is intimately invested in us. So this is why God said, this is the design. This is God's rules. It's not mine, it's God's. This is his design. And the fourth thing he says is sex in marriage is supposed to produce shameless pleasure. Have you ever noticed what the first thing God says to Adam and Eve after he makes them is? Chapter one, verse 28, go, be fruitful, multiply. What he's saying is, I'll see you in half an hour, guys. (laughs) He's like, Adam! Adam! Hey, Adam, Adam. And Adam's like, whoa, wow. And he's like, "Uh, Eve, excuse me, Eve. And she's like, oh, wow. And the guy's like, hey, guys, guys, guys. Oh, just go. (laughs) Enjoy each other. Be fruitful. Multiply. Have fun. Have fun. And then we'll talk about prayer and faith and all this sort of stuff. That's the first thing, how cool is God? And we say, like we talk so much in the church, like, oh, sex is a sin. How dare you talk about sex? God, when he created Adam, he didn't just have this handful of nerve endings and be like, well, what the heck am I gonna do with these? I know what I'll do, I'll just chuck it down there and see what happens. That's not what he did. It's intentional. He wasn't surprised by how much Adam and Eve enjoyed it. He's not surprised at the fact that sex is great. He made it that way. He created it that way. He knows he is the master designer. He's like, this is supposed to bring immense pleasure and joy in the right environment. He's like, that's why I made it, because I'm good and I know what's good for you and I'm not a killjoy. That's not who I am. You follow my rules, you're going to have fun. Sex should be fun. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it properly. That's truth. It's biblical. This is God's design in marriage, that there would be shameless pressure. Watch this. Watch this. Adam and his wife were both naked. Verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt what? No shame. Watch this. Adam and Eve Nudity, God. No shame. God's not absent. No shame. There's delight. There's joy. No shame whatsoever. 
Friends, we've got a whole world that's talking about safe sex. Have safe sex, safe sex. Friends, sex is not safe. You can try and stop yourself from reproducing. You can try and stop yourself from acquiring a sexually transmitted disease, which we're going to talk about in a minute as a byproduct of what comes when it's outside of God design. But sex is not safe. There is nothing safe about opening up your soul, your very being, and connecting that to somebody else's life. There is nothing safe about that. It is vulnerable. It is risky. It is frightening. It is exciting. There's nothing safe about sex. So stop talking about having safe sex because there's nothing about sex that's safe. Sex is like nuclear fission. It's powerful. It's God's gift to marriage, to unite and to bring his primary purpose into the world. This is, it's nuclear fission. It's incredible. And in the right reactor, it'll light up a city. It'll shine his light to the whole world. But take it out of the reactor and it becomes a bomb that will destroy the very city it was created to light up. There's no such thing as safe sex. It's dangerous. It's powerful, but it's glorious. And this is why God says he knows this. He made us. And he's like, for marriage, ish, ish, ah, together, in marriage, one flesh, one union. And there will be no shame whatsoever. And here's the fascinating thing, because if we take page one and page two as true, then we need to take page three as true too. And that reveals that God has an adversary. And if God has an adversary and he knows the power of sexuality, and he knows that what God creates is good, but he also knows that his purpose in life is to counterfeit what God created, that his job is to pervert what is pure. If you're an enemy of God and you know the power that exists in sex and sexuality and marriage, what's the one thing you're going to do? You're going to attack it. You're going to attack it at every front to turn that reactor into a bomb. And so in chapter 3, we read something fascinating. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from that tree in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll surely die. You will not surely die, said the serpent to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, circle that, underline it for food, and pleasing, circle that, underline it to the eye, and also desirable, circle that and underline that. For gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Why did they sew fig leaves? Because there's shame. Seven verses ago, God, Adam, Eve, sex, no shame. Something tragic has happened in the garden. Because what brought no shame, what brought joy, what brought unity, what brought life is now bringing shame. And it came from a liar who uttered a simple phrase into the garden's evening air, why can't you have that fruit? Why not that fruit? What's wrong with that fruit? It's good. It's pleasing. It's desirable. Why not that fruit? What kind of a God would tell you that you can't have what you desire? What kind of a God would deny your right to something which is good and pleasing and desirable? What kind of a God would say no? What kind of a God who loves you would say, that's not for you. I know your desires, but you can't have it. What kind of a God would do that? He's not loving. He's not just. That's not fair. Here's what you should do. 
You should become your own God. Here's what you should do. You should take that fruit. Look, touch it. What did he say? He said, if you touch it, you'll surely die. Touch it. Uh, uh, uh. Did you die? No. Nah. Go on, take the fruit. Take the fruit. What's wrong with that fruit? And so Eve takes the fruit and consumes it. And all of a sudden, what was shameless and wonderful and glorious is now shameful. What's happened? Because in the garden now, as Eve stood there, she had a choice. There was the Lord, there was the liar, and there was the lollipop. Your choice. Are you going to listen to the Lord and his design? Are you going to listen to the liar? You choose. You're an adult. You choose. And here's the thing about sex and marriage and our culture because we have chosen that fruit. We have chosen that fruit. And we need to understand that this enemy, this adversary, there's a reason he went after it. There's a reason he's attacked because he knows the power of sex. He knows the power that this holds. And if you know the power in which God wants to move in the world, then you, like you're gonna attack that. If you're a warrior, you're gonna attack the most important sites of that city's communications. You know, you're going to attack that space. So the enemy comes out and attacks that. And we see in our world today this constant attack in this area of sex and marriage. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. A constant attack. Why not that fruit? Why not that fruit? What are you going to do? Why would you believe him? This constant attack. Like, have you ever noticed that in a dating relationship, some of you haven't had a dating relationship, so you might find this out later on, but when you're dating, it's like, it's hot and it's heavy and it's amazing and you're like, oh, we're trying to be pure, we're trying to follow God, we're trying to do the right thing by God, but oh my gosh, this is hard. This is so difficult because I just want you, you're desirable, you're good, you're pleasing. And you're like, how the heck are we gonna do this? And you're like, I can't wait till we get married. This thing's gonna be unbelievable. We're gonna be going 24-7. The neighbors are going to come and knock on the door and they're going to be like, hey, you guys settle down. You're keeping us awake. And you're going to be like, yeah, ah, yeah, damn straight. Look at me go. Yeah, that's what you're thinking. You're like, this is who I'm going to be. And then three months into marriage, it's just you two and no one else. And you're like, what do you want to do? And you're like, I don't know. What's on Netflix? <laughs> like, the, the enemy's just a, like, before you're married, he's just desperate to get you to take this gift out of the reactor. And then when you're married, he's desperate for you to not use the gift within the reactor. And then whenever possible, the whisper comes when the wife is away or when the husband's away. And it says, why not that fruit? Because if it can get you to bring another fruit into that reactor. And it's so easy for us in our day and age, it's so easy for us to look at this and it makes me think of my beautiful son, Benji, who will sit there and he will stomp his foot and he'll be like, why? And tears are flowing down the eyes. He's, why, why? And I'm like, because you're six. And I'm your dad. And I know what's good for you. And I know you want it, but you can't have it. And I can't explain to you in your mind, in your level of comprehension, the greater workings of my understanding as a father and how I'm not really about you in this exact moment. I'm about you 60 years from now, being a man of God and integrity and healthy and happy. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not just trying to please you now. I've got bigger plans for you. So no, you cannot have ice cream for dinner. And we say, why God? It's good, it's pleasing, it's desirable. Why would you give me these desires and say I can't use them? What? I, two weeks ago I was preaching and this kid, not a kid, a young man came up after, and I hadn't preached on this at all, but he came up and he had tears in his eyes. And I just hugged him 
and I started hugging him, I, like, I could only describe it as guttural weeping, shaking, almost convulsing. And he just said, it's so hard. He was just revealing to me, same-sex attracted. He desperately wants to follow God. He knows God's good. He knows his dad. And he's like, it's so hard, Dave. Why would he give me these desires? And in that moment, I'm left with a decision. I'm sitting there. I'm like, all I can do is hug you. And all I can do is cry with you. And all I can do is say, you know what? I can sit there and I can complain and I can say, why? And there's stuff that I look at this. I'm like, yes, why, God? Why? Why? It doesn't make sense to me. But what I need to do in that moment is I need to stop and I need to look in the rear view mirror and I need to look at the fruit of the fruit. And I need to say, well, has my God, yes, I've been disappointed. Yes, there's stuff that I've longed for that has not come to pass. Yes, there's things in my life that I'm like, God, why are you doing that? But has he ever let me down? We've just spent 12 chapters in Hebrews looking at how good he is. We've spent 12 chapters looking at the fact that he has provided for us in every way that he's brought us out from under the curse of the law. We spent 12 chapters looking at the fact that he has redeemed us and brought us unto himself. The picture he promised in Genesis 2, that we would be brought into life from death to life with Christ at the hand of his sacrifice, what he brought for us. He has made all things new in him. And in that moment, I can say it's not fair or I can say thank you for your faithfulness. I don't understand it but I can either trust the Lord or the liar. And yes, it's good and it's pleasing and it's desirable and I want it, but what is the fruit of the liar? Death. Just look at our world. Sex slavery. Slavery is at an all-time high. Slavery is higher than it's ever been before and we say that it's been abolished. We have a bill before our parliament right now that is going to allow abortion up to full term. Divorce is 50% in the church. We've got rape, we've got abuse, we've got mental health, child pornography, Our world is falling apart at the seams. Why? Because it took the gift out of the reactor that God gave it. Why? Because we said, why not that fruit? And we took the fruit. Why? Because God said, it will lead to death. And we said, why? And he said, well, I'm God. And sometimes you have to trust my character. But hey, you're an adult. You make your choice. And so the question I have for you is, who will you follow? Will you follow the Lord? Or will you follow the liar? Your choice. Your choice. But before you choose, watch something else. Because in Hebrews 13, it carries on and it makes a comment here. It says, God is going to judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. And here's the thing, we look at that and we say, well, that's not fair. How could a loving God judge me for choosing to pursue what's good, pleasing, and desirable? How could a loving loving God do that? That's not fair. And here's the thing we need to realize. It depends upon whose house you're in. Whose rules will you come under? You see, if you choose to make your own rules and become your own God and do it your own way, then you are outside of the house of God. And if you're outside of the house of God, then you are subject to the judgment of God because he is righteous, just, and holy. But if you are in the house of God, and if you say, do you know what, God? I'm broken, I'm battered, I'm bruised. I don't understand why this piece of paper It's been torn and it's been attached and it's been torn and it's been attached and it's been torn and it's been attached. I don't even know who I am anymore. There's a part of my bios that's attached to the bios of everybody else. And you say, what am I supposed to do? And God says, you come into my house. And if you come into my house and you come into my rules, there's a rule that you need to know because that rule is that judgment and that uh, punishment that I'm passing out on the sexually immoral and the adulterers, that's getting poured upon my son. 
and I'm going to pour that out upon him. And the promise is that in his death, you will come to life and you will be a new creation. You will be set free. Whom the sun sets free, they are free indeed. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. You will be new, new, new. His mercies are new every morning. And when you wake up in the house of God, all of that's gone. And I wish I had a scientific experiment that I could show you this tattered piece of paper that dips into something and comes out clean. I don't know how to do that. I don't even know if Luke Starzak knows how to do that. But that's the truth of what God has done. He's saying, whose house will you be in? Who will you listen to? The Lord of the life? Because the Lord will redeem you. So honour marriage, yes. Keep the marriage bed pure, yes. It's about you and your partner. Don't listen to the lie. Don't let anyone else into that bed. But if you've got dirt on your feet, if you've been playing on the beach and you're all sandy, don't hop into your sheets and filth up the bed. Have a shower in the grace of God. Get clean in the grace of God. Allow the mercies of God to wash over you and just go, oh, yes. And repent. Grab your wife's hand and say, babe, we need to pray together. Pray that God will invigorate your sex life because he made it and it's good and he wants that for you. Pray that God would heal you of the addiction you've created by chasing the fruit. And he will because he wants that for you. That doesn't mean the the liar is not going to keep coming and whispering in your ear, why not that fruit? Why not that fruit? And in that moment, you have a choice. Who will you follow, the Lord or the liar? And the great encouragement from this text is that we would be a people who walk in the mercy of God who rest in the redemptive work of the cross, who know that we are free, that know that we're a new creation, no longer bound by the curse. And I don't understand everything that God is doing, but I know he's good. And so I'm going to choose to follow the Lord. So I'm going to invite the band up. And we're going to close. And because I've got a little bit more time, I just want to finish with a little illustration, which I hope is helpful for you guys. Imagine for a moment that this painting is a gift that I was given by someone who discovered a rare da Vinci. And this person came to me and said, Dave, this is a gift of infinite value and worth. And I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. Here's my question to you. What do I do with this gift? Do I hang it on my walls and throw a party? Do I say, hey, Sam, come look at my painting. In fact, why don't you come and touch my painting? And Sam's like, oh, I love your painting. Can I take it home? I'm like, sure, take it home. He's like, can I show my friends? He's like, sure. Take it home, show your friends. In fact, I'm going to take photos of it and I'm going to send it to your friends for you. Is that what I do with something of infinite worth? Or if I truly know this is valuable, do I keep it under lock and key? Do I put it in a vault until someone comes along who's qualified to touch it? Someone comes along who understands what this is worth. Someone comes along who says, I get it. There's no way I'm touching that thing. There's no way I'm touching that thing until you What do we do with the gift of infinite worth? Friends, our sexuality, marriage is a gift that God has given us to change the world. 
So the encouragement is husbands, honour your wife's painting. Wives, honour your husband's painting. Enjoy it. Take care of it. And to my single sisters and brothers out there, honour your painting. Look after it. Don't go sharing it willy-nilly. It's too valuable. It's too important. It's too precious. Don't let anyone else start painting on the painting that God has given you. Wait. For God's design is good. God's design is good. And if you've had this painting all messed up, you've made some mistakes, you've thrown some parties, you've let some people in and they've done stuff to it that you wish they hadn't done, just remember who the master curator is. Just remember who gave Michelangelo his skill, who gave da Vinci his skill. Just remember the one who can make all things new. Come to him, rest in him. Let him restore your virginity as he will. And then walk in the power and the freedom that he has bought you. Let's stand to our feet. Loving Heavenly Father, this is a difficult topic because our world is so loud, but this is not hate speech, this is love. Hate speech is the voice of an enemy. Hate speech is the voice of the one whose purpose is to steal, kill and destroy who would say, why not that fruit? But love, love is the voice of the one who says, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow me. Because that same God denied Himself. That same God left the throne of heaven and humbled Himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why? So that we would know the love of God, so that we would be restored and renewed, so that we would be made whole. That is love. May we walk in that love. Father, may we follow the Lord and not the liar. May we follow the one who came that we might have life and life to the full, who loves us, who designed it a particular way for a particular purpose and knows what he's doing. Not the liar. We love you, Lord. We give you honour and praise.